which is amazing. We've got Dr. Asher Marks, uh, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at Yale, Director of Pediatric Neuro-Oncology in the Adolescent and Young Adult Programs, also a Child's Play board member, which is amazing, Coach of the Woodbridge under, Underdogs Lego Robotics Team, Go Lego, Lego Robotics. That changed my life in uh, physics in senior year of high school. Love it. Um, and uh, with a research interest in XR applications in pediatric medicine and a lifetime gamer, Dr. Ashermark, welcome to the symposium. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm just going to bring up my little PowerPoint here. Give me one second. Hey, thumbs up if we can if we can hear. I for some reason can't hear. Mm. Dr. Marks, everybody else is a thumbs up. I'm gonna leave you guys alone. All right, sorry to interrupt. No, no worries. All right, here we go. Can everybody hear me okay? Can, some, can somebody tell me that you can still hear me and see me? Anybody? I'm gonna go ahead and make some assumptions here that, that everything is working nicely. Um, so first, I'm, I'm thrilled to be um, at this conference. I'm, I'm thrilled that this conference is happening. Um, this is something that you know, I've been wanting to see for a long time, getting you, know, you all together. It'd be great if it was in person, but but I'll settle for this. Um, and I'm excited to be able to talk a little bit about, um, you know, I was debating what to talk about. So so, so what I ended up with was this topic, but I'm gonna delve into a few more things as well, really looking at these technologies from the perspective, quite frankly, of a medical snob and, and, and someone kind of obsessed with academics and metrics and, and how can we make these technologies more um, accepted by, by the mainstream medical community. Um, and so I think that uh, one of the things that often comes up here is looking at extended reality, meaning VR, AR, and MR, mixed reality, as a medical device. Um, and I think that to start with this, um, it's important to first define what a medical device is. I think that we all already think of these tools as medical devices, but there's a very clear FDA definition. So I'm gonna go through what that is, um, and I'm gonna ask some questions about it, and some things I want you to think about. I then want you all to have a general sense of the categories of XR research that have been published and think about how your work, the work that you're doing right now, can contribute to um, or, prevent, or present new avenues uh, towards this research. Um, I want to be able to explain the complicated research infrastructures of some, you know, these major academic institutes so you can have the basic understanding of how to navigate these um, in what is really quite a complicated bureaucracy, something that takes um, a lot of time and experience to really get used to or um, to leapfrog that, just finding those champions within those bureaucracies to help you do what you want to do. And then last, uh, just give a sense of where XR Tech is headed in clinical care. And, and I think that, I hope that this lecture is going to be a great kind of sequel uh, to what you've already seen today. So let's start with, with what I think is a very important question. Do we want XR to be defined as a medical device? I, I think initially it seems like a little bit of a no-brainer. Of, of course we wanted to, but there's some downsides. And I think those come about when you start looking at the true definition of a medical device. So medical device is defined by the FDA. Um, as any instrument, apparatus, implement, machine, appliance, implant, in, vi in vitro reagent or calibrator, software, material, or other similar or related article intended by the manufacturer to be used alone or in combination for human beings for one or more of the specific purposes of. So in that initial statement, I think that, that it's pretty clear that XR is included, but the one loophole here may be the statement that says that it must be intended by the manufacturer to be used uh, for these reasons. So that begs the question, if the manufacturer does not explicitly intend it, is it? And I don't know if anyone has that answer yet. Uh, something to think about. So the purposes are below. I'm not gonna read these all for you. Um, I'm gonna read the important ones, and that's gonna be the second one, 
The second one is definitely something that we deal with the, with the way that we're using these technologies. Diagnosis, monitoring, treatment, alleviation of or compensation of an injury. The first one says the same thing except for disease, so disease or injury. And that's definitely something that, that you guys do. And, 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 and so it's important to keep that in mind. Um, the other important one on here is going to be the uh, second last one, providing information for medical or diagnostic purposes by means of in vitro. I'm sorry, the last one, which does not achieve its primary intended action in or on the human body by pharmacological, immunological, or metabolic means, but which may be assisted in its intended function by such means. So in this broad overview, it appears that XR is going to be a medical device. So why are we not defining it as such and looking for the FA approval um, for it? Well, there are a couple reasons. For one, any, quote, medical device needs to be approved and regulated by the FDA, which, which we know would make our lives a lot harder. It needs to show safety and efficacy. I think that's something that we can do. We have shown. A lot of the literature already goes through that. Um, but we would have to kind of go through a multi-year process to convince the FDA of this. Um, medical devices tend to be more expensive than consumer devices. I think a great example of this is simply what I've come across with Oculus. So in trying to find ways around the need to sign onto a Facebook account using an Oculus headset, Oculus had suggested that I go through their basically business program, um, in which case instead of paying $300 a headset, they would allow me to pay $800 as well as something like a $1,200 a year fee per headset. So much, much, much more expensive. And that's not even as it being defined as a medical device. That's simply being defined as not a consumer device, but a business device. Device. So we got to keep that in mind. Any update to what we're using, whether it be hardware or software, would, meet, would need to be communicated to the FDA. Um, and people need to be properly trained to use a, quote, medical device. What would the benefits be? Well, in a, any intervention based on a medical device is more likely to be reimbursed by insurance companies. And that's somewhere, um, that's something I'm pretty passionate about. We are, we are, right now working through our telehealth department uh, to uh, get some of our VR interventions reimbursed um, as telehealth. Um, if we were using this as a medical device, that would likely be a bit easier. Um, and then uh, an intervention based on a medical device is more likely to be accepted by practitioners and administration. And this is something that I'm gonna harp on you know, as I go through this. Um, and, and I do think there are ways to do that beyond defining this as a medical device. So just a question to think about, you know, if XR is going to fall into the medical device category, what else does? Well, I would argue, you know, most of the tools used by our child life specialists do that would range anywhere for, from toys uh, to games to, you know, basically any distraction technique, um, even some pain alleviating techniques, such as the kind of little busy bee, you know, vibrating guy um, that helps prevent uh, pain during vena puncture. So, so it's a bit of a slippery slope here. Um, and I think it's it's something that I want you all to think about. If you look at certain XR products on the market, some that have already been mentioned actually have gone through FDA approval. And what is actually approved is the software itself and not necessarily the hardware. So that is one way to think about things. Um, but I, I think it's important that we keep this in mind as we go through kind of the, the rest of this talk um, as to what do we want XR to be and how do we legitimize it if we are not going to go through the medical device pathway. So let's um, just talk a little bit about VR um, and, and, and AR. You know, people have already done this today in a, in a much better, more thorough way than I'm going to. Um, but something I want to do today is 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 give you tools that that help people at different levels of the medical bureaucracy, tools that will help convince physicians, um, other child life uh, specialists, um, mid-level providers, whoever that may be, however that may be identified, um, and very importantly, administration. So this is a chart that my, my administration kind of fell, fell head over heels for. This is done uh, through a Gallup poll. This was published in the New York Times. And this is a great chart looking at US technology adoption rates by household. Um, and that red one at the end is the adoption rate of virtual reality. Um, and what you he see here is this slope is incredibly steep and is, is you know, matched only really by cell phones and, and maybe color TV. Um, but the adoption rate from about the mid-2000 mid teens has just really skyrocketed. 
Um, and I think this is something that's really important to to show business folks, to show people worrying that maybe VR is a flash in the pan, is a fad. Um, but this this graph really tends to speak to people. So it's 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 one that I encourage you to keep in mind and and use to your benefit. I want to talk a little bit about the history of VR because I think that this is relevant in looking at the future um, and understanding how we got where we are and exactly where we are. I think for a lot of people just coming into the use of these technologies, there's the impression that either one, it's a very new technology, uh, or two, it's been in the state that it's currently in for a long time. And the fact of the matter is, um, as, as I think Dr. Joe alluded to a little bit earlier, um, we've all been waiting for things to hit the Oculus Quest level. You know, before this, you know, I think, you know, a lot of you have probably seen Google uh, Google Box here, which which was a phenomenal publicity stunt, uh, where Google, Google told everyone to kind of look under their chairs and they're going to find their next virtual reality headset. Um, they showed just how cheap, mobile, and uh, and uh, accessible this technology can be. We then had Galaxy, uh, I'm sorry, Gear VR, um, which was the next step. Then we finally had the uh, Oculus Go, which was really when we started looking at bringing um, these medical interventions uh, as quickly, as easily as we can now. In the interim, we've, we've got, you know, a Vive headset and of course an Oculus Rift, which is really, you know, room level, not really usable for our patient population. And finally, what's become our standard right now, which is the Oculus 2, six uh, degrees of freedom, um, all built into one single affordable headset as, as you're all quite familiar with. What I find really interesting is taking a look at the literature of virtual reality in medicine. Um, and what you find it are these kind of two these two humps. One, you know the the, the biggest increase is absolutely right now. Um, but there was other research done back in the early 90s. and in correlating when these leaps and downs happen within the research, it really does follow pop culture. So what was going on in the early 90s? Well, there were two things. One was the advent of, uh, Dave and Buster's restaurants. I, I'm sure you guys are familiar with those now. They came about in the early 90s. They were much more um, high end, really marketed towards kind of the late 80s yuppies and cities. Um, and they had this kind of well known device uh, called Pterodactyl Nightmare. And that was kind of the first VR device I'd, I'd ever seen, kind of the first one out of the lab. You know, certainly uh, some some uh, people like Walter Greenleaf were doing things in the lab prior to this, but this was a $60,000 device, um, cost $10 to use for five minutes at a time, and it was terrible. Um, very little uh, immersion at all, very choppy, very nausea-inducing, uh, but it was there. And, and so people started wondering how they could use it. Around this time, also 1992, was the movie called Lawnmower Man, which is a Stephen King movie. Um, and it, it was really kind of one of the public's first forays into virtual reality and just a sense of even what that was. Um, it's a bizarre movie. I don't recommend it other than for historical uh, reflection and, con and, and context. And now we've got today, you know, clearly I, I think the, the biggest reason that we're seeing VR take off and, and being looked at as a modality used in the hospital is, is Oculus. Um, and we do have our pop culture counterparts in Ready Player One, the book, the movie, Ready Player Two, the book, um, which I'm happy to talk about where I think that's going to help lead things. The, the themes in there I think are, are a little bit, they've been trotted before. And, but in some ways they're a little ahead of their time for the mainstream. So so I think there's some interesting ethical issues that are going to come out of it and people will bring up if it becomes as popular as the first one, um, but we'll see. Now a little bit about extended reality. I think you guys already got a very good review of extended reality. Um, as it pertains to medicine, it's mostly being used on the medical education side. Um, most of the devices are are not quite where they need to be. Um, there are continuous rumors about Apple releasing a $2,000 device in 2022. Those rumors pop up at this point almost every few weeks. Um, so it's looking like that's probably going to be a go. Um, and my hope is that that's when a, what's going to bring um, extended reality or aug I'm sorry, augmented reality into the mainstream. And, and then I think we'll really have an opportunity to think about how we're going to use that in the hospital, um, which we're already doing here um, and, and we will continue to do. Um, I think it's Apple's impression that virtual reality is going to be kind of a stepping stone to, to augmented reality, which is where I think they feel that the real progress is going to be made. 
So just to go through kind of real quickly, I think you guys have probably caught on onto this um, trend in looking at XR in medicine, um, where the research has already been done. So if, if you go on a PubMed and you start looking through uh, virtual reality in medicine, um, you'll see really it tends to be broken down into three main categories. The most obvious, I think, and kind of lowest lying fruit and the stuff that, that you guys do day to day and have the personal experience to to support, you know, beyond hard data is alleviation of pain and anxiety. Um, so it, it does this through distraction. I, I think whenever you're looking at these studies, it's really important that they show that it's better than other interventions, other forms of distraction. Um, and I think some of the best work done on this was by an author named Hoffman, um, where he got actual virtual reality into functional MRI machines. Um, where it showed, you know, areas of the brain, you know, lighting up that that needed to be shown to light up to show true distraction and and true uh, fooling the brain into immersion that they are where they where they thought they are. Um, also used a lot in education, primarily with students and trainees. Um, we have some some uh, uh, use cases here at Yale that we're that we're starting to look at. Um, it's not used with patients quite as much for education. I know that at, at the Proton Center at uh, Hospital University of Pennsylvania, they are using a um, Oculus cardboard type device to show their their patients around. But it's quite frankly, it's more of a a uh, I don't know. It's, it's a gimmick at this point and on many levels. But um, we would love to do this to show patients kind of their 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 tumors and their disease processes and, and help them understand what they're dealing with a, a little bit better. And then there's motivation and, and dare I say the word gamification. I think it's one that we're all hesitant to use, but um, there are uses in the physical therapy, occupational therapy world where this is absolutely shown benefit. Um, and there's some great uh, evidence out there. Um, real world examples of this is, is studies showing reduced pain in sickle cell patients in crisis, uh, reduced pain and anxiety in breast cancer patients, reduced pain and anxiety with pediatric venipuncture, VR travel in Google Maps and terminal cancer patients, um, and VR in educating breast cancer patients about radiation, as I, as I mentioned a bit. I, I do find it interesting, this VR travel via Google Maps, because in my experience, that's a very nausea-inducing um, application. I, I'd love to hear how others are using that. Um, but, but there is a, a nice study out there on it. So what's more? So we, we've got these three areas that have been researched. Is there room for more research? Absolutely, absolutely. We, we can always do better studies, larger studies, more convincing studies, studies that look at uh, more relevant clinical outcomes, studies that look at um, uh, quality improvement, uh, spending of money. We can always look at that and we've got to do that. But what really excites me day to day in looking at this kind of work are other use cases for extended reality. Um, so the first one I have on here is psilocybin. And I don't know if anyone's familiar with the work of Michael Pollan or some of the work being done at Hopkins or NYU, uh, essentially using magic mushrooms for things like uh, depression, um, alcoholism, um, and end of life, uh, basically metaphysical crisis. Um, there's a group out of England suggesting that they can trigger the same brain pathways that psilocybin does. And this would be, quite frankly, a game changer for pediatric oncologists like myself who has adolescent and young adults um, and even some older kids at, at end of life uh, who are going through these, these feelings, the emotions, um, to have a VR intervention that could really help them on, on, a, on a really psychological, psychiatric level um, would be remarkable. So it's, it's something I'm really interested in. We're in the very early stages of, of exploring it. Um, but in my mind, this is kind of one of those real reach projects in VR, like how, how crazy can we get? But it, it's out there um, and, it, and it's interesting. Um, empathy is a big one. Uh, literally being in someone else's shoes. This is something that we're looking at in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, there are some. There was actually a great article in the New York Times about it, about how it doesn't work. Um, however, uh, I think we have some ideas about showing people their own implicit bias, um, using it as opposed to putting them in someone else's shoes, which I think could be a really interesting way to go about it. Social VR. Um, this is a big, a big project that we're doing here using um, support groups. Um, within uh, VR. Um, psychiatric uses has been done a lot, desensitization, uh, repersonalization for patients who are going through a depersonalization, so visualizing their body from above and re-entering. Uh, procedural incorporation. Um, so this is the, the kind of things that, that you've already heard a bit about, using these during lumbar puncture, 
um, bone marrow biopsies, you know, on our side, um, going through MRI and things like that. I think a lot of that work's already being done. And then DEI and, and biopsy work, which I already mentioned a bit when I mentioned the empathy work. So it, if we're going to get these things up and going and we want to do trials that really are listened to and and are respected by by the, you know, more conservative bureaucracy and, and academia, I think it's important to kind of know what clinical trials entail and, and what they look like. The majority of extended reality trials that have been done thus far, I'd say, would probably fall within the pilot or phase one trials. Um, pilot trials are, are small. They are really done to show that the work you want to do the pilots. I'm sorry, I'm not making sure my connection's working here. We lost you for a quick second there, but you're back now. Awesome, thank you, okay, cool. All right, the next are phase one trials, and, and these phase one, two, and three trials, this, this is really terminology mostly used in the world of, of, of medications. Um, but again, to, to get the buy-in, I think we do need to, to use these trial designs. So a phase one is all about safety. You know, are, are these interventions safe? And that's definitely something that 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 has been looked at in the XR. Um, interesting, interestingly enough, I, I've been in talks with some people over at Oculus now. And if you look at the Oculus box, it actually says for use in patients in sorry in in people 13 years of age and above. And I wanted to know why they made that recommendation. And the only answer that I keep getting back is lawyers, lawyers, lawyers. I don't think there's any basis in it. Um, so I, you know, I would love to, to talk to them. We've got hopefully a, a phone call up, up and coming soon to talk about, you know, how we convince them to, to change that age limit, um, and, and, you know, potentially get some people together to actually get a trial going in, in people under 13 to show that, that VR is safe, uh, unequivocally. Uh, phase two trials look at the efficacy of something, and then phase three trials look at the efficacy of one intervention versus the gold standard. So in VR, the uh, the example of this would would be um, looking at uh, pain relief uh, as a result of a VR intervention versus narcotics, um, and this is something that you know I would love to see some of these sickle cell uh, studies take the next step in uh, and prove uh, because that's another way that we're going to uh, move forward adoption of these technologies. Now, outside the concept of a clinical trial is frankly, what is oftentimes a less rigorous and easier way forward, and that's through quality improvement. Um, quality improvement projects really just show that the intervention, excuse me, you are using in improves the patient experience in some way. Um, and so it's much easier to get things like this through review boards, um, easier to get these published, easier to get the word out about them, and, and frankly, easy to get administration excited. So to, to kind of give an example of, of how a, a clinical trial using VR gets through, I'm, I'm gonna go with, with some of the work that we've been doing here, which are these um, VR support groups. And, and if you guys have been to the um, IVHRA conferences, IV, IVRHA, Inter International Virtual Reality Health Association, I've, I presented this here bef there before. And so I'll, I, I'll try not to go too in depth, but I wanna point out some really important points about this project and what it took to get this going. Um, so this was a project with adolescents and young adults with cancer. Um, they're underserved cancer population. They require special care and resources. They have decreased overall survival, a lot of that due to clinical trial uh, lack of availability, but a lot of that can also be traced to psychosocial issues. Um, and, and when looking at that, we know that psychosocial uh, outcomes are better when patients have access to other patients um, with similar disease processes and support groups. So we wanted to get support groups together. We thought it would be an easy thing, but we found that none of our adolescents and young adults had any interest in coming back to the hospital when they don't have to be here. They had lives to live, they had jobs, they had families, they had school. And so we needed a way to, to, to get them here. And of course, the easy one would be something like Skype um, or something like finding an outing to, at, for dinner to get them all together. Um, but the at the time that we were designing this, it was clear that the, uh, at this time, I believe the Quest was about to launch. Um, I think it was a little bit before the Quest. 
I think Go, Go was launching is where we were. Um, and we had some really early studies, for example, this Hunter paper I mentioned, looking at the values of immersion and backing up with functional MRI. Some of the studies mentioned earlier about the value of patients sharing a space. So, you know, if they're in VR, they are literally sharing a, a virtual room. They are sharing a space, which we can't do through something like Zoom. Um, we also have them a bit captive. You know, we, they can't be distracted on Zoom. I know we've got about 100 people watching this now. I'm sure some of you right now at this very moment are checking email or checking checking Twitter or, you know, on Twitch or, or whatever. Um, so, so we have them captive. Um, we can express full body language using VR. Um, and again, that idea of a shared space and experience. We also saw opportunities for self-expression through avatars. Um, and also a lot of the reason our patients didn't want to show up in person is they didn't feel like themselves. They, they had alopecia, they were bald, they were cactus, they were skinny, um, and, and they didn't want to be seen. So this was a way for them to represent themselves and be seen in a way that they wanted to be seen. So, so all those things made this very attractive uh, technology for the AYA population. So some hurdles, and I think this is the real value in talking about this. Um, the first thing we had to do was, was choose software, and, and there were some you know, clear off-the-shelf options. We had Altspace, we had Rec Room, we had Facebook Spaces um, for what it was at the time, which is nowhere near as robust as it is now, but these all had their own issues. Um, we had privacy issues. You know, When we would go into an Altspace VR session, no matter how much we had it locked down, you know, people inevitably were able to show up. Um, Accessibility and ease of use. We need, we wanted something where people could just sign in and they would be in the room that they had to be in. Customizable. As this project went on, we wanted to be able to make changes and improvements. We I can't do that with any of these big companies. Minimal distractions. These all involve, all of these interventions involve some capability to have distractions in some way. And that's something that's going to be, I think, beneficial as we move this project forward. But initially, we really wanted just a space. We wanted patients focused on the support group um, and not, you know, small games and, and interactions uh, beyond it. We wanted to be hardware agnostic. We know that hardware changes so, so frequently. We didn't want to have to change up the intervention. We wanted spatial audio. We had patients in this intervention within a circle. So knowing where the voice is coming from is incredibly valuable. And we wanted uh, it to be sensitive to body language. We wanted subtle movements to be able to be uh, uh, communicated through VR. So we ended up with a small company called Fortel Reality. They're out of New York. This iteration of the software is, is probably about two or three major iterations old. Um, it's still this room, the detail is much higher, um, but this is what we're using. We now kind of clouds floating by, and, and this was designed in coordination with our AYA. So we really wanted their input as, as to what they were gonna be uh, playing a part in. So early challenges and requirements, whenever you have a trial, whenever you have a study going through, it's gonna have to go through multiple um, committees. Many of these committees not at all familiar with virtual reality or extended reality. And, and, and I saw this first when this protocol went through the protocol review committee. This protocol started at about, I think six pages long by the time they were done with it. It was a year and a half later and about 32 pages. Um, I actually formally sat on this committee when this came through. The committee was used to running through uh, phase one trials with potentially very dangerous drugs. Those went through in about 20 minutes. And like I said, I was stuck about a year and a half just because they didn't know how to wrap their head around it. So it is really important to be able to communicate what is truly a, a, a really novel um, technology for a lot of these people on these committees. Quite frankly, they tend to be older, not in the world of technology, but medicine. Uh, the, the protocol review committee or PRC is there to ensure scientific viability and rigor. Um, there does need to be a formal protocol, consent form, safety manuals and algorithms. Uh, and, recruit, and recruitment tools. Um, and these all need to be formatted in similar ways that drug trials are because this is what we have. So we've got to work within you know, the, this, this structure. Um, this group in my case was a group of oncology trial experts, again, not technology experts. They're not used to reviewing non-medical interventions or, or non-pharmaceutical interventions, I, sh I should say. And, and again, a little understanding of the, of the technology. So it took a long time to, to get them to understand it. Um, I actually had to go to outside experts and say, yes, this is an okay technology and this is safe. It then had to go through what's called the IRB, the Institutional Review Board, and this is more about patient protection. Um, it has to prove that things are safe. Um, and frankly, it went through this pretty quickly and, and, and I was surprised. Um, they were most concerned about protecting personal health information um, as opposed to physical harm. And then 
the night before launch, I got a call from Yale's intellectual property lawyers and HIPAA lawyers, and this resulted in having to bump the project another three months. Um, so these are all really, you know, challenging things that you have to sometimes get through. Sometimes you can swerve around them, um, but oftentimes you can't. Um, the, the safety concerns that did come up were physical and mental safety. Um, this picture is an example of, I think, what a lot of them were imagining happening due to their lack of understanding of the technology. The real concerns came down in self-harm, um, which can come you know, come into play with any support group, any psychiatric intervention. With ours, it was particularly concerning because these patients would be at home alone with no one to physically intervene. Um, and so we do have a protocol built in that if patients disconnect, um, if they don't call myself or the social worker running the group within five minutes, we actually are forced to call 911. Um, thank God, knock on wood, we haven't had to do that yet. Um, also are looking at anxiety, nausea, and we're actually right now doing a project looking at infection risk, um, which uh, Max could tell you all about. We had Max, uh, well, actually uh, someone Max works with trying the headset and we got no growth. We are culturing the headsets. Um, love to talk that, about that in a little bit because it's something that you guys are all struggling with, but we hope to produce some data showing that we can sterilize these pretty easily and effectively. Uh, clean box is something that many of you are probably used to. This is something that we use. Um, again, I don't want to delve into this too much because it's a whole lecture in and of itself, but it's it's something that that can present hurdles. Um, the trial itself, I'm not going to get into too much detail here, um, but it, it would be defined as phase one to two, four patients per group, five groups, 20 patients total. We've got four of these groups done, one more to go. Um, and it's got an invisible observer as well to help us kind of collect the data. Sorry, just checking time. You don't want to take take all your space. Um, it's important when you design a trial to have tools that have been used before. So we're using tools, one's called CD Risk, looking at resilience. We're using tools called Promise, looking at anxiety and depression. Um, and then just basic five to 10 minutes of, of, of our people using it to tell us what works, what doesn't, so we can improve it moving forward. Um, challenges we've had, networks in the hospital. This is probably stuff that you guys are all familiar with. Privacy concerns over Facebook. Um, battery, sanitation, VR fatigue. This is Amanda Garbatini. Uh, she's had some real hair issues. It, it may seem silly, but she's got to see patients when she's done a VR session. She's got to come out of VR and see patients and, and you know, coming out with kind of marks in her face and, and looking a bit frazzled isn't, isn't always, you know, what she's looking for. Um, obtaining more hardware has improved. When we first launched, we could not get a hold of Oculus 2s, but we're, we're good now. Uh, and funding, always, always an issue. So I, I think this this slide is not a humble brag, though, though though maybe it is. But the point of it is is to show that you can get publications out there without yet having really solid data. And 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 you know, like I said, our data is not done. But but we got out that we were doing this, and we've had publications. You know, four of them listed here at the bottom. Um, we took the work we were doing and kind of described that work along with other digital technologies and we're able to get that published in a journal called the Tr a journal of adolescent and young adult oncology you know not a high power journal which is but, but that's fine you know it got the info out there and for people looking for it they can find it um and then again i talked about this a bit at uh the uh international virtual reality uh health association so when talking about these things, you've got to keep business model basics in mind. And these are the things that um, administration is going to want to see. They want to see how much it costs. They want to see the benefit. Um, and frankly, when we throw these numbers at, throw our numbers at the administration, they were amazed at how inexpensive this is. $300 headsets, you know, people make the argument, well, these headsets, you know, how are you going to get them back from patients? And, and in reality, um, I'd say many of our patients see $300 worth of donations, whether it be in toys or games or, or something else through their treatment. And, and so I do believe we can have, you know, $300 headsets donated to patients for keeps. Um, we've, we've done it um, and, and it hasn't been that difficult. People, um, especially small foundations and private people who got the money to do it, love to see their money go through to, to something tangible. Um, the software has probably been the biggest cost here. It's eighteen thousand dollars a year, but this does provide us with uh, true ability to have some control over it and, and what we need to use. Social work time commitment, uh, one hour per session, documentation time is also pretty significant. Coordination has been minimal. It's just about receiving headsets, uh, cleaning them, technical support. 
Um, we've been able to use, you know, Max to the fullest for this, um, and it's been it's been very very doable. Um, and like I mentioned, I, I've got meetings with telehealth. We had their first one a couple of weeks ago, another one next week, and it looks like we do have a billing model so that this intervention can be reimbursed. We can actually charge for this um, as if it is telehealth, and, and that is absolutely huge. That is a way to potentially keep this going without having to look for constant funding, and that's that's the goal, right? We, we want something that is um, uh, self-sustaining. So our next steps here, um, this is Kim Hefchi. Uh, she is a PhD that we sniped from the section of internal medicine. Um, her work was initially in gaming. She runs a Play for Real lab. Um, it's about education and she has had a renewed, or, or not a renewed, a, a, an accelerated interest in using extended reality in pediatrics. So we very recently founded a group here, XR in Pediatrics, and right now we're in the process of talking to people throughout the pediatric departments here. and and telling them about the technology and hearing what they're interested in. And we have, honestly, I'd say 10 to 12 potential product, projects right from the get-go with some very, very excited people. So I, I guess the biggest thing I have to say about this is get the word out, talk to people around you. Um, the, the work that be, can be done with this technology, quite frankly, I think is beyond anything that we um, have considered are considering when you know the more knowledge you get in um the more now the more productivity you can get, get out and, and and this is a way to i think really really be productive um so right now we're again we're looking for some some further funding for the for the group um because the interest is there um and so we're super excited about it um and hope to have some new you know interventions uh established as a result of it Let's share some examples of student ideas um, we've got uh, Dr. Tom Murray, who is our infectious disease guy. He's talking about an intervention uh, for training to show how viruses spread uh, using a you know VR headsets. Mark Auerbach is a simulation expert. Um, he does uh, co-type simulations, and he's interested in using AR and VR to kind of up that up. We're working now with the gender clinic, which is incredibly exciting when you look at avatar technologies and what that can mean for um, uh, gender dysphoria. Um, empathy of, of family and loved ones and things like that. So very exciting. Again, I keep bringing up the psilocybin. It's a pipe dream, but it's so, so cool. Um, sickle cell pain, the study's been done. I would love to show that we can decrease hospital stay times and narcotic use using VR um, for, for sickle cell pain because that's what administration responds to. Um, we're going to expand our groups and we're going to make it a full QI project, these support groups in VR. Um, and then again, more PTOT work uh, we're looking to do here. So to, to review real quick, what is a medical device? I, I highlighted the areas here that I think are, are relevant and what puts XR technology in as a medical device. But a, again, um, I think it's something we need to think long and hard about. Do we want to define XR as a medical device? Are the benefits worth the loopholes that we'd have to jump through? I'm being very honest about this, perhaps too, too much so. Um, I think for certain interventions that make sense, but I don't think we want to define hardware itself as a medical device. And that's it. That's it. I, if I have time, I'm happy to take questions. Um, if not, my uh, email address is simply asher.marks at yale.edu. Thank you. Dr. Marks, that was awesome. Thank you so much. I think, you know, if somebody wants to throw a couple of questions in the chat, um, I'm trying to keep up on it right now. If you're willing to answer a couple, we can do that really fast because we do have some time that we could make up um, in a couple of sessions. So while we've got you, if anybody wants to throw questions, do you have the chat open, Dr. Marks? I have it open now. Yeah, yeah. I'm just looking at it right now. One second. Hey, shout out! Great presentation. Thanks. <laughs> and I concur. You guys are just giving me props. You know, give me some hard truths. Throw some questions. <laughs> Nothing. Okay. Okay, here we go. Could you describe the psilocybin simulation experiences? Yeah, so all I've gotten are, are some are some pictures of them. Um, and it's they're really, quite frankly, not as impressive as as you would think. Um, they, you know, I think the most interesting ones would probably use a kind of AR component um, out facing cameras to distort the world around you as psilocybin usually does. The, these are more um, almost kaleidoscopy, um, generic landscapes, melting, you know, things like that. Um, but the 
important thing about them is, is more about their activation um, of the, I think it's called the DNP, the default neural pathway, um, which is what is uh, triggered in, in psilocybin use and, and, and what the researchers at Hopkins and NYU feel are most likely the, the reason for, for their uh, successes using it. Um, did you say you have research for the use of VR sickle acute crisis and decreased hospital and say? So the, the metrics for that um, are not yet for length to say. That's what I would like to do. The metrics for that were done out of California. I believe it was UCSD. Don't quote me on that. But the initial study was looking at improvements in pain and sickle cell disease. Um, I, I feel like it was a missed opportunity to actually use, uh, you know, metrics such as decrease narcotic use and decrease hospital stay. So it's something that, you know, once I have the capacity to, it's something that we would I would really like to do here because that's something that the hospital really responds to. Um, limitations for FDA approval for VR and A are on the hardware side. Where do things stand with and with that? And why is it easier to get software approved rather than hardware? I don't think it's necessarily easier to get software approved. Um, what I'm saying here is that to if you were to have a hardware device approved as um, a medical device that results in all of the downsides with few of the upsides, right? So you would end up having the device likely be more expensive, being more regulated, where if you were to do that on a software by software basis, you know, you could reap some of the, some of the benefits with certain software and then use others as, you know, kind of more freely. Um, Joe's, if you go down the medical device route, how do we not fall afoul of Moore's Law and remain agile and use current tech in the hospital? Absolutely, and that's exactly my concern which with going on on the hardware side, you know, it'd be constant FDA updates. Um, so I agree with you. And, and that's a reason that I, I kind of skirt away from it. Uh, Andrew, PTOT areas, fantastic interventions, patient conversion disorder, love it. Thanks, thanks for the, the shout out. Um, Benioff has a white paper, would love to see it. Eric, thank you. Uh, and Kind VR, yes, Kind VR is ab absolutely um, using this with uh, with sickle cell, um, and I believe that their intervention was part of the data that was collected out in California. Um, that being said, you know I, I think that the use case in sickle cell is very much based on um, distraction, um, and so I, I do think that that kind of VR is not the only game in town for this. I think there are other ways to do it um, if you don't have access to kind of VR. All right. Awesome. Thanks again, everyone. Excellent. It was a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mark. So glad to have you with us.